You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Welcome in, Teak Nation Podcast listeners. My name is Alex Swinson. Delighted to be back with you. It is Tuesday, February 22nd, 2 2 22. Happy Tuesday. Uh, really excited to bring you the interview here this week. We have a student at Fairleigh Dickinson University, Madison, out in New Jersey, FDU Madison, um, Tau Theta chapter. He's actually the current pylorities for the Tau Theta chapter, Quaddy Adams. Um, and Quaddy is going to share his story. He's going to get into a little bit what he's doing on campus, but a uh, really great opportunity to talk just about the Teak experience, talk about what Talk Have Epsilon has done in his life, and then talk a little bit about Black History Month and about diversity, equity, and inclusion with Quaddy. So um, excited to share with you what he has to say, and we will go to that right now. Quaddy. How are we doing tonight? First and foremost, how's everything going? Pretty good, pretty good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Just a pretty, pretty low key Tuesday night. But that's what happens when you get married and have children. You know, it's uh, <laughs> just every, every night's pretty, uh, pretty much the same. So just heed that advice, you know, as you, you can tell your future. Um, didn't mean to turn this into an advice column. Um, Quaddy's here. Uh, very excited to have him. Very excited to get some, um, some perspective and, and some, some wisdom. Again, he is an active Teak member at, at FDU Madison. Um, and Quaddy, I just, you know, uh, there's a few things I want to get into with this conversation. But first and foremost, I want to talk about Teak. I want to talk about your experience as a member of Talk Kappa Epsilon. And, and the first question I have is just what drew you to the Teak chapter there? What compelled you to to join that chapter and, and become an active part of the T group there on your campus? Um, I will say the active president at the time, Justin Barnhart, um, he reached out to me before I had even, um, you know, got on campus for my st- first semester. He reached out to me, you know, we'll talk here and there. We found out that we had a lot of things in common. So, you know, every now and then, you know, every few days we'll have a conversation or whatever. Um, eventually he uh, tried to like lure me out to the apartment or whatever. Um, and I was like hesitant at first just because like, I didn't know, I, you know, this random guy hit me up. I didn't know what was really going on. Um, but eventually I gave into it and I went and I, uh, spoke with the guys and stuff and I got to know a few other guys and we would hang out here and there. Um, and then once I got to know them and like the rush season came around, I was like, you know, like this is something I want to do. Like after meeting the guys, it was, um, the way I like to put it is that I knew that. I wouldn't look back after joining Teak because I was comfortable fitting in, not fitting in, if that makes sense. So I can say like a lot of the guys here at our chapter, they're different, all of them. You know, there's not two guys that are alike. Um, Everyone has different perspectives. Everyone's really open-minded. And it's just a great, it's a great thing. So I would say the brothers and, you know, just them being so open and so different really drew me to teak. And I think that's something uh, not enough chapters do. You mentioned Justin, and I know Justin a little bit, but um, reached out to you before you were even on campus. What did that do just for your your mindset, your mentality, knowing that you had a group of guys that the day you set foot on campus for the first time, were going to have their arms open, ready to, to bring you in and, and, and make you part of their group? Um, I'm not going to lie. A little bit, it like, it scared me at first. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I was like, who? Like, who are these guys? Like, they were all strangers, you know what I mean? Um, And it was a bit of a a culture shock, you know, coming from, I'm from Salem, New Jersey. I don't know if you know where that is. It's like deep down south, but in Salem, it's very, very um, heavy. And the the Black community, the Black population, everything like that. So when I came here, I was like, I I don't know, you know, I was a little weary of these guys. Um, But like you said, it was really nice to have at least one friendly face when I stepped on campus, you know, somebody to show me around if I ever got lost and things like that. Um, so I was, I was scared just a little bit, yeah. but overall, like I was really excited to like have that friendly face. And how do you believe your college experience has been enhanced by being a member of Teak? What opportunities have you had? What experiences have you had that, that you think you would not have had if not for the fraternity? I would definitely say networking. Um, a lot of people my age wouldn't agree with me, Um, And that's okay, But networking is key to success because, you know, it's not about 
who you know. That's about who knows you and who knows how hard you're going to work and who knows that, you know, you get up every day and you're going to push in. A lot of guys and Tika and Valtrimary, when they say, you know, Quadi, Quadi going to get up, Quadi going to go do what he got to do to get where he want to be. You know what I mean? Um, and it's constantly opening doors. Like even this here, like this podcast, when I was so excited about it, like tell my friends, and you know, like to them, it might be like this small thing, like, oh, you know, like you're going to speak on a podcast, but like, no, like to me, right. not only am I speaking on a podcast, I'm meeting another person, you know, like that's another relationship that I can form and bond with this other person who then can open up. You never know who can open what doors for you. You know what I mean? Um, so networking is key and Teak is definitely a great source of networking. Well, and, and I'm glad you said that because I, I couldn't agree more. And I've had so many opportunities just through my life and my career because of the fraternity. And so I'm glad, I'm glad you view it that way. And I'm glad that you have seen some of those benefits. Obviously, it's nice to have the friends and the brothers and get the leadership experience, but it really is. If you want to make it a lifelong experience, it is a lifelong experience. It's something yes. that you can, you can sink your teeth into and be a part of for the next 60 years. Right. And yeah. um, we we're talking a little earlier about you going to the RLC this weekend. I think that's going to be another great chance. You know, I would encourage you just to, to meet everyone that you possibly can while you're there and, um, and take it all in. But I, uh, I think that's a, that's a huge benefit. So I'm glad, glad you brought that up and shared a little more on that. Um, I want to shift now to some of your involvement on campus, because I know I read a little bit of the, the backstory where um, you had you seek to start a black student union on campus. That's not something that existed when you got to FDU Madison, and that turned in to kind of a whole other project and opening other doors for, for other individuals on campus. Can you talk a little bit about that, about what that process was, where it ended up, and just what was it that drove you down that path? What was it that that caused you to say, I'm the guy that's going to make this happen? I'm I'm the leader that's going to make this happen and and then ultimately led to you making it happen um there's a there's a few different parts one um where I come from we don't have anything I mean the city is a mile long a mile wide we don't have a grocery store we have to drive like 30 minutes to go to the nearest grocery store like it's it's terrible so you know I always made that promise to myself like if it's for me to have I'm going to have it and I'm going to get it. You know what I mean? So when I came here, I came with that drive already and like that hunger to just go and get whatever it was that I had to get. Um, so that's like part one. Part two was definitely like tea because it was like scary, like coming in and like being with like all these guys who weren't, you know, people of color. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like I just needed somewhere where I could feel safe in my own skin. And now like, being in Teak for so long, I still, like, now I feel comfortable on skin, but at the time, it was, like, I need somewhere where I can go to, like, you know, just sit back, relax. I don't have to, like, look over my shoulder, worry about what's going to happen next, um, and so I pondered on it for a little bit, and then this was all in my first semester, and I was, like, you know what? I was, like, I think I want to start some type of something. I was, like, whether it's just us hanging out or what, and then, um, I ended up joining Teak and rushing and doing all that. And so I put it on the back burner for a little bit. But then the second semester came and I was like more comfortable in the fraternity and in my, you know, my campus life. And I was like, okay, yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna pick this project back up. And I was like, wait a minute, something, something inside me was like, yeah, like, uh, -uh like this don't feel right. And so I sat on it for a little bit and I was like, you know what? I was like, maybe there's other people that feel exactly like me, whether they're you know, part of the LGBTQ plus community or whether they're Muslim, whether they're, you know, the anime kids that everyone picks on, whoever they are, you know what I mean? I was like, maybe there's other people that feel like this. I was like, what if I open it up to everyone? So instead of it being a black student union, I then formed a diverse student union. And, you know, the word diverse doesn't stop at race. You know, it goes on to go for sexual orientation, gender, sex, um, you know, what games you like, what movies you like, whatever it is. And you can ask anyone on campus, like the events we host are so wildly different from each other. Like every event is different from the next. Um, and I think, I think it's a cool thing. Yeah. Where do you think that, um, uh, maybe the word is just kindness. Where do you think that came from for you when you made that shift to say, um, you know, I'd like to have a black student union on campus and then say, you know what, what, why should I limit this? Or why should I, should I close this off? Right. Where, where we want everyone to be a part of this. We want everyone to feel included. Where do you think 
that came from inside of you? Is that part of your upbringing? Is that something that um, kind of bubbled up with you in high school or when you got to college? Like where does, because not, not everyone feels that way, right? People, some people are very selfish and they want what they have and they want to keep it close and, and they want their experience. And, and I think part of what makes what you did so spectacular is just the fact that you said, no, this is this is something I, I want to create an experience for everyone on campus, everyone who maybe feels a little different, who maybe feels like they don't belong with a with a specific group. I want this to be their home. Where do you think that that level of care and compassion comes from? Um, I would say it came from my upbringing. Um, and, you know, I grew up I grew up rough, you know, uh, without getting too much into detail. Yeah. I, I had to raise myself as well as my five siblings that I lived with um it was it was crazy like it was just rough and no one really like I had people reach out and be like hey like you know I see you struggling you know do you need somebody to talk to type thing but no one like there were a few people who did like my uncle my uncle Varen that's my best friend he'd been my best friend for you know years now like since I was like four you know what I mean but no one else really like reached out and was like hey like you know if anything we would like joke about it um and to them it was like a joke and to me you know it was like a way to laugh at the pain to kind of like you know just kind of forget about it I guess in the moment um but it still it just wasn't you know it, it wasn't satisfying that no one was ever like hey like you know I see you going through this what do you need like what can I do for you um so I know what it's like to be in that situation where you know you feel the way you feel and like no one's really looking out for you so you know when I came here if if I can help you if I can look out for you then why not you know what I mean and that's what we do so so if you don't mind me asking how did you how did you get then to, to FDU from from your upbringing what was was there a moment when you said I'm I'm going to college I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to bigger and better things like what was that decision process like for you because again um you know I I understand that 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 not everyone has that opportunity so what what at what point did you say yeah this is my path this is where I'm gonna move my life forward I would say as soon as I was old enough to realize like hey this isn't right you know what I mean like yeah. from the cold showers to you know watching your mom come in drunk every night passed out I was like yo like this isn't this is not normal you know what I mean um we relied heavily when I said I mean emphasis on heavily on government assistance um my mom hadn't worked since I was like eight years old she still doesn't um you know we're surviving off of food stamps wick uh what else? HUD, you know, that our HUD pays for our house, all of that. Um, I could be wrong with a number, but I want to say like all together with like the child support and you know this and that, we made probably like somewhere between like 16 and $20,000 a year. And to some people, they're like, oh, you know, like that's, that's it. No, not for a family of seven. That's not a decent amount of money, you know? Right. Well, um, not New Jersey either. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? Expensive. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that really, that really just stuck with me. And I was yeah. like, I don't want to live like this anymore. So, you know, I made sure I got up every day. If I didn't take anything seriously, I took school seriously, you know, and I made sure that I got here. Um, and here I am, I'm here. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. That's, that's, um, means a lot to me that, that you, you went down that path and, and obviously got to where you are and, and decided to join Teak and, and bring your talents to the fraternity. Um, I'm curious, you know, what, what did you learn about yourself through the process of starting the, the diverse student union? Obviously, um, you set out to help other people. You set out to, to create a space where other people could belong. But what did you learn about yourself? What did you take internally through that process that's going to stick with you and that you're going to carry on to your career and your life beyond college? Um, I, people always told me, like growing up, they were like, yo, Quadi, he's going to be famous. He's going to be on TV. He's going to be this. He's going to be that. He's going to be president, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, no, no way. Like, you know, small town, big problems. You don't believe that stuff when people are saying it to you. You know what I mean? Um, but now I can say I have a lot more confidence in myself. Still not, you know, a whole lot like some people have, um, but definitely a lot more than I had. And I can like look at myself now and be like, yo, I'm a lottery ticket for real. Because if I see something and I want it, I'm going to get it. No matter what I got to do, how hard I got to work. You know, I might slack here and there just because like it's weighing down on me and that's okay. Cause it's not about how, 
how hard you fall. It's about how quick you get up. You know what I mean? Um, so I would say that I learned that I am strong, like real strong. Yeah. Um, just pushing through everything that I pushed through. And back then it was like, you know, it was like, okay, like you did it because you had to. And it's like, I didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? I could have let my thoughts take over. I could have let anything override me and my drive. And I, I really don't have to be here right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I would say my, like, I learned that I'm strong on the inside. Um, my mental, everything like that is just like concrete at this point. Um, and I'm going to go like, and if I see myself getting somewhere, I'm going to get there. So, yeah, that's, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. And, and you're, you're going to find, I think, as you, as you go through life, right, that, that, that mental toughness is, is one of the qualities I think that is most important in, in any leader and any human being, if, if you are mentally strong and you can get knocked down, get back up, right. Fail and learn from it and, and bounce back from it. Um, that is, you know, that's a quality that I think everyone can, can stand to, to improve on. And, and, you know, I'm sure you still have things that you want to work on and, and yeah. ways to go. But, um, I think that, that you, you brought that up so so early in your life is only going to benefit you moving forward. So um, that's that's great. Uh, I appreciate you appreciate you sharing that. Um, I want to I want to shift because it is it is February. It is Black History Month, and I know diversity and inclusion is something that that you are passionate about. Um, why do you think it's important? Why why do you think it's valuable for us as a fraternity, for us as a society, as a country, to continue to celebrate celebrate Black History Month and continue to learn the lessons that that come with that? And obviously, there are lessons that permeate throughout the entire year through you know 24 7 365 but having an opportunity through february to maybe reflect on those a little uh more heavily why why do you believe that's important and why do you believe that that we as a as a culture should continue to to lift that up and and, and learn those lessons i would say um one you can't escape it you know no matter where you go where you work wherever there's going to be a person of color there um and instead of trying to run from it run from those problems, uh, like face it head on and, you know, like get to learn from that person because you never know that guy that you're avoiding every day at work because you have this perception of him because of whatever, you know, how, how like if it was because of what, how you were brought up or movies that you watched or whatever, that guy could be another open door for you or another opportunity or whatever, like another friend, you know, um, and you're missing out on something great because you have this perception of who he might be when really that's really probably not who he is. Um, I had an event today, it was called Culture Jam, and it was basically an insight on the black experience and, you know, what it's like to live in America as a black person. Um, and we brought up some very, very nice questions. One of the questions were, um, what's something that you think white people should know? And one of my answers was that you guys, like you have to be accountable and hold yourselves accountable. If you look at the textbooks, it says, oh, you know, like this is what happened to these people, but you know, it's getting better now. And one, it's not really getting better. And two, the people that are, that was doing this to us are probably your grandparents, your, your, aunts and uncles, you know, like all these people are still alive. Ruby Bridges is 65. Well, you know what I mean? So like this stuff isn't old. It's not like it happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's here. And, you know, if we don't start holding these people accountable, like, hey, like this isn't right, then it's going to keep progressing and progressing and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You know, we brought up, um, there were a few people in the audience who brought up how they have um, racist family members that they have to distance themselves from. And I'm like, that's good. Like you have to hold these people accountable for the things that they're doing because this isn't right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't like us. You don't like this group of people because of, I, I don't know, like this perception that you have. But if you really take the time and get to know these people, you never know. Like you never know. You might, you might be wrong. I mean, I don't know. It It's crazy. Like I could go on and on and on, but like, it's just important that we learn from these things because like I said, when it comes to like the workplace and whatever, you're not going to get away from it. Like you have to, you have to go head on and like face these problems because those people, the, us, we're always going to be here. Like we're here. We're not going nowhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's, 
it's a tough conversation to have. I mean, it's, it's certainly, and, and I, I applaud your efforts to at least to start to move the needle right on, on your yes. campus and just through this conversation and, um, and, and through the little bit that we talked, understanding that you're not gonna you're not gonna sleep on that, right? When you graduate, right? Is it's not going anywhere. It's something that's that's a part of you, and that you're gonna continue to to push and promote throughout your life. And um, and I think that's something that we we could use from a lot of different corners of society, of America, of the world. Just the ability for people to to share their experience and and help others understand, right? That maybe their experience isn't the only experience that that should be reflected on so right well, again like you said could could go all day on it but i i appreciate you i appreciate you shedding a little light and, and sharing a little insight just into how you're having some of those conversations on your campus and um what your experiences have been um you know uh, that was that was really my last my last big question um is there anything else just that you you know you have a platform now and Teak Nation podcast, anything you want to share with the fraternity and you want anything you want to share with the listeners, anything on your mind that um, that you think is worth putting out there for uh, for Teak Nation? I want to say um, thank you personally for having me um, and just to all of the guys in Teak, like all around the world, like thank you for being such stand up guys. Another thing that really drew me to Teak, honestly, was when we were going through like the uh, the new member process. Yeah. Um, there was one story and I honestly shame on me for forgetting the guy's name, but you know, uh, <laughs> I forget the guy's name, but I just remember the story and it was like, you know, he started Teak, um, and he was like, Hey, you know, I want this to be a fraternity for all people, no matter what, like something like what I'm doing with DSU. Right. He's like, I want this to be, you know, a platform for all people, no matter what they look like, who they are how they smell, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, whoever the person was, whether it was the president of the campus, the dean, whatever, he was like, no, like, you're not doing that. And this guy, he was like, you know, well, F you, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and he ended up somehow doing it. And that was one thing that really drew me to Teak, like, wow, like, even way back when these guys were stand-up guys, like, they didn't let the world influence their perceptions of anybody, whether it be Black people, um, lesbians trans people whatever like they didn't let that affect how they felt about anybody and you know so thank you to all the t guys because i know like here any i don't know how the other chapters do it but here we really look at a person's character before we allow them into the brotherhood um so i know if it's like that anywhere else i know that every guy listening to this is a stand-up guy and i just want to say thank you for that well, I, I appreciate it, Quadi. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your your insight and, and sharing a little bit and getting getting a little vulnerable. Even that um, that mean means a lot. And um, I know that that our members and listeners will appreciate it. As I said, Quadi's going to be at the RLC this weekend, so maybe you're uh, maybe got your your AirPods in, listen to it on the airplane or in the car on the way to, to Jersey City. Um, find him, say what's up, seek him out. I'm sure. I don't want to speak for you. I'm sure you'd love to shake some hands and, and yes, get sir. some more some more guys. So. Um, like I said, that's going to be a great opportunity and, and just having you here has been, uh, been fantastic. So can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. Good luck with, with everything you're doing and, uh, have fun this weekend in Jersey city, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Quaddy. Thank you. All right. Yep. I'll see you. All right. One final gigantic thank you to Quaddy for his time. Um, and just his willingness to, to share. First time I met Quaddy was uh, about four minutes before we started that podcast recording. So uh, just to, to open up like that and share a little bit about his background and and, and everything was uh, was really a privilege and looking forward to seeing him continue to grow in this fraternity and, and move on to, to bigger and better things, both with Teak and with life. So if you're going to the RLC this weekend, um, shout him out. Let him know, find him, say hello. Uh, if you're not going to the RLC this weekend, A, you're missing out. B, uh, maybe you'll catch him at, uh, at Leadership Academy or Conclave. Who knows? But that is our show for today. Appreciate you listening. As always, appreciate the, uh, the half hour you carved out for the Teak Nation podcast. Make sure that you have smashed the like button, that you have subscribed, that you have liked, that you have um, done all of the requisite back work to ensure that you are the very first person to learn when a new episode of the Teak Nation podcast is available. That is all for now. I'm Alex Swinson, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.